Thank you all for coming. Philippians 1.3 says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. My grandma and grandpa have the scripture engraved on their rings. Papa was dearly loved by so many of us. And as we remember him today, we should be grateful for the legacy he's left behind. 56 years of marriage, four children, 12 grandchildren, and one great-grandchild are alone, admirable. My grandpa was an army medic, a teacher, and a pastor. We should thank God for our memories, for our memories of him, because after all, what would our lives be without him? As we rest in his passing, we can find victory. We can rest assured that he is in heaven. At his bedside, I had the privilege of reading him this scripture, and it's John 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. Ye believe in me. Ye believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Hi, I'm John Fortmeyer from Newburgh. Uh, my wife Sandy and I lived over in Astoria from 85 to 93, and uh, we were very, very active in, in Philadelphia Church there. We moved down to, uh, to Astoria uh, from Anacortes, Washington, and our pastor there was a pretty easygoing, mild-mannered type of person. And then we moved down and met Pastor John. <laughs> and uh, it was just just like like he was describing here. He was direct, and he was um, uh, you know pick your favorite adjective to describe Pastor John. Uh, he he was he was uh, a little cantankerous sometimes, and uh, excitable. Um, uh, for some reason, um, I'm in newspaper work, and he took a particular interest in in me. And I, he he always was kind of. I think he expected me, for some reason, to have a little cynicism in my in my personality, and it, it fascinated him that I, I wasn't that way. And, and he and I got to be wonderful friends. Just and and he was a dear counselor to us. So many memories as a for me as a uh, young. Man, a family man. Uh, we had two of our four kids uh, born there while we were there. And how many? How many of Pastor John and Betty's grandkids are here? Can you raise your hand? Okay, that is just inspiring to me because my wife and I we have eight grandkids now, and I knew your grandfather before he had grandkids, and he was pining away for grandkids, just pining away. And, and when I say he was excitable, he was really excited with each one of you that came along. And, and one of our favorite sayings from, from him, besides my, 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 was uh, if, if a baby was crying during the, uh, the service, he'd say, the sounds of life in the house of the Lord. <laughs> and he'd be so enthusiastic about kids. But I noticed as, the, as his number of grandkids increased and they started to tire him out, which I can understand. Uh, he was a little less fervent on that point, so. Um, I just have so many memories. I can, one, one last thing I'll share. Um, our youngest child, uh, daughter Megan, who's now uh, 23, uh, we almost lost her during the pregnancy. 
uh, it was very touch and go for a while. It really looked like, like we were going to lose the baby. It was great concern. My wife had to go on bed rest for a couple months. And I was at work there at the newspaper in Astoria, and Pastor John called me, and he said, he said, John, the Lord has given me a word that this baby is going to go full term and arrive safely. And you know, Megan arrived on her due date. And uh, just so many memories. I'm uh, Charlie Gessler, and John was also a spiritual father and a mentor to me. And uh, I remember getting together, getting to know him early on, and maybe some of you remember this quote, but he looked at me and he said, Charlie, you possess one of the qualities I admire most in a friend. You like me. <laughs> he had so many of those, and as he got older, he informed me when we'd get together, he goes, you know, I just don't have many opinions anymore. And then we'd talk for the next two or three hours about his opinion. <laughs> he was actually my favorite theological sparring partner, so my favorite memory of John, I was visiting him again, it had been a while, and you know how he can be a little direct? I walk in the door and he looks me up and down and he goes, you appear to be more substantial than the last time I saw you. <laughs> he was calling me fat. And he goes, in my day we used to have a saying, great girth indicates great worth. <laughs> and just trying to keep up, I said, I understand, John. I'm just being biblical. Godliness with contentment leads to great gain. And I grabbed my stomach. And without missing a beat, he looked at me and said, I understand. All of the fat was the Lord's. <laughs> Hi, I'm Carol Ahola. Um, my husband and I met John when he, uh, actually we were itinerating in 1973 in Hawkinson and just immediately felt such encouragement from him. So much so that even though we didn't know them that well, they came over and visited us when we were in our first term missions as missionaries in Japan. And I remember it was such a hoot to share Japanese culture with John, like taking him out for raw fish and him looking in the aquarium and he said, you mean we're going to eat that what's right there, swimming right in front? And so it was just so much fun. And one of the funny things is we have a nice house, but typical at that time, um, our bathroom facilities were less than very American. Um, our, our toilet facility was the size of a small phone booth, and it was just a hole in the floor. And um, there was, that was where things happened. And so, <laughs> so John, he told me that he wrote the kids, and he said to them, I want you to go into the bathroom, lay your hands on the toilet, and sing the Hallelujah Chorus. <laughs> I also remember he so profoundly influenced my theology. Um, it was, uh, I was, remember where I was in the kitchen and John was sitting in a rocking chair there in the morning while I was fixing breakfast. And he was sharing um, just wonderful grace. He had such an uh, understanding of grace. And I turned around to him and I said, John, if I believe that, I just sin all that I could. And he jumped up and he pointed at me and he said, God said you'd say that. God said you'd say that. And of course, he quickly brought me to Romans 6. Shall we sin that grace would abound? God forbid. And so that was so important. And when we came home um, pregnant with our fifth child, and he saw me. Now, this may seem too direct for some of you, but it was such an encouragement. I was 38 years old. I was tired and feeling very old and very great with child. And he looked at me, and you know how much John loved family. People would ask him how many kids he had, and he would say, four, so far. <laughs> and so he looked at me and he said, Carol, you're deliciously pregnant. <laughs> and um, I've never had that adjective ever <laughs> before. Loved the man, loved Betty.
My name is Bob Goldsby. I was born and raised in Vancouver and served in uh, local congregations there. Eventually went to seminary and was ordained and came back to Vancouver and started Shepherd of Love. 1977, and John Lancaster was in the neighborhood. We had a group of pastors that met together on a regular basis. But John mentored me in some really significant ways. And my first congregation, my first attempt to make it, you know, as a pastor, it, it was amazing the things he shared with me. But one of the most uh, important things, and my wife just reminded me of this, one of my younger brothers, there were six of us, and one of my younger brothers had walked away from God. And he got in touch with John, and John brought him back to the Lord. And he served as a pastor for many, many years. He's now in Minnesota. He had two strokes recently, but when he had those strokes, he was the head of a ministerial organization that supported pastors that go all over the world and train them and give them. Uh, I'm going back in May just to visit with him. He's recovering from the stroke. God's doing amazing things there. But John has touched countless numbers of lives. I can only imagine what it was like when John came before the Lord and the Lord began to show him the effect of John's life and his word and what he's been doing both with family and through family all over the world. I think the same is true for us. I think John would want us to have that message. You're important. God wants to use you. He is using you. Submit to the Lord. Follow him. He'll do far more than you can even ask or think. My name is Sylvia Weinstein, and I had the privilege of being one of Brother Lancaster's students way back in uh, the late 60s, early 70s at Portland Bible College. And he was one of my very favorite teachers, and he taught the Christian ed of children. And a couple of the things that I remember him saying were always put cookies on the shelf beyond the reach of the kids. And I, I think of that. And he also said, put your best teachers with your youngest students because they have to do the translation from the complexities of the gospel to make it very palatable and understandable for little children. And I love Brother Lancaster very, very much. And I still, I work with four-year-olds now, and I think of it as a great calling because I think I'm, maybe I'm one of the, the better teachers because I get put with one of the youngest students. And I think that it's a real challenge and a real, a real calling from God to do that. And I just um, appreciated the fact of Brother Lancaster's influence in my life. I'm Mike Lowell from Ben, and I went to Bible college about the same time as Sylvia did. And uh, <clears throat> I signed up for a class with John, and he told us all at the first class, if you decide to drop my class, please come talk to me first. And so uh, I, I don't know what it was, something that, you know, as direct as he was, I just thought, oh, I don't want to take this class. And so I, <laughs> I uh, went, went to the registrars, and he happened to run into me while I was canceling his class. <laughs> <laughs> and he came up to me and he said, I, I thought we made an agreement that you would come talk to me. <laughs> and I said, oh, oh, I guess I forgot. <laughs> and uh, anyway, he uh, said, so well, come on in my office. And so we sat down and talked a little bit. And uh, he wound up becoming one of my uh, closest Got down to a real personal level, and he uh, had a way of, 
I ch not just uh, spewing out things, but trying to make you think. And he uh, did things that uh, caused you to question things uh, rather than just, so to speak, trying to indoctrinate you in something. And uh, he uh, said to my wife, <coughs> I like her because she asks a lot of questions. <laughs> and uh, anyway, John became a good friend, and along with Pastor Iverson, we had him uh, marry us during our marriage ceremony. My brother and I both uh, <coughs> proposed to our girls uh, within the same week, unbeknownst to each other, so we just had to have a double wedding, so we had two pastors do the job. <laughs> it's a great heritage. I'm Gary Jameson, um, son of Donna Jameson. Um, earlier today, we had a um, military burial uh, for Papa. Uh, and being uh, in the Air Force, um, whenever I'd go visit him, he uh, would ask me, he's like, oh, so when are you going to become a lieutenant? Um, I don't know if you guys realize that I'm becoming a lieutenant, becoming an officer. So uh, I was like saying, oh, i got a few years left. Uh, of school, and he'd tell me a story. He's like, "Oh well, I, you know, they offered me to become uh, an officer, a warrant officer, but I, you know, I turned it down. He ended up going to uh, to college and um, met his wife. So I think uh, it was just an honor to be um, a grandchild of of John's and to see the the military honors. Um, and I'm proud to to carry on his heritage." My name's Chris Shalman, and I pastor, uh, used to be Philadelphia Church, now Gateway Community Church. Our young people decided to change the name to protect the innocent, so <laughs> we, uh, we did that. Um, I have got to do what I love to do for over 20 years because of Pastor John. There's no way I would have ever got to be a pastor if it hadn't been for him. And uh, I love to preach, I love to teach, I just, I love to minister to people, and, and it was it was because of him. Uh, he made that, that happen. Um, he is one of the most quotable people I have ever <laughs> met in my life. I mean, you guys, I, I couldn't remember why. You guys are just coming up with one after the other after the other, and, and he would say those things over and over again. Um, but uh, my, 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 yes. He, he was... He was probably the least pragmatic person I have ever met. Um, what Pastor Dan said, you know, he said you have to separate the, the how from the weather. If, you, if you're supposed to do it, then you'll have to figure out how to do it. You know, that's, that's, don't, don't put those two together because then you'll never do anything. And uh, I just remember one time where he had some elders that were, uh, maybe it was just one, anyway, putting some pressure on him, you know, that they didn't like the way he was doing things. You know, and basically said, we're going to take the money away. You know, you're not, you won't have a salary if you don't do it the way we want to do it. And <laughs> Pastor John said, God didn't call me here to get a salary. He called me here to be the pastor, so go ahead and take my salary away. <laughs> I mean, he didn't, he just, he didn't care. He was just going to do whatever God told him to do, and that's, that's the way it was, it was going to go down. I, one time we were, uh, Really, I don't know, this happens all the time in church, but anyway, we were hurting for money. We, we needed some money. And uh, I thought that it would be a great practical joke, okay, to uh, have a friend of mine, who Pastor John didn't know his voice, call him up. And uh, our church is, is on the coast, and there's fishermen there, and from time to time, they make a killing. They can make a lot of money in Alaska or wherever. And so I had this guy call him up and say, hey, my name's so-and-so. Uh, the previous pastor, when he was there, I promised that if I ever made a million dollars in one season, I would tithe to Philadelphia Church. And without hesitating at all, Pastor John said, oh, well, I know what his name is. I'll call him up, and you can get in touch with him. It's Dennis Sawyer is the person you want to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, 
he, he would throw cold water on the sacrifice so much that it was the only way it was going to happen is if God did it. <laughs> okay. uh, I'm like, you know, we could help a little bit here, you know, Pastor John. But uh, anyway, uh, your mic is on. My, I'm not sure why. I think, what does the red light mean? It's out of batteries. Okay. That's, that's so, a sign. There's nothing I can do. That's a sign I'm supposed to stop. <laughs> <laughs> but I will press on anyway. Right. Um, one of the things Pastor John would often say, because uh, I don't know, how many people ever got into a theological debate? debate? <laughs> one or two of us. You know, I'm hoping that right now Jesus is straightening him out. <laughs> but, uh, that's the point your dad is. Um, one of the things he would say is, he would say, I don't care what you think. I don't care what I think. All I care about is what has God said. That, that was his life. And I, I want to I wanna read. Uh, wow, I need my Bible if I'm going to do this. Do you have my Bible sitting there? Yeah. I want to read a scripture that just... Uh, is all Pastor John Lancaster. It's Hebrews chapter 11. And I'm, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm going to skip around a little bit in here. But at the beginning it says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. When I found out Pastor John uh, had passed away, I was not unhappy at all. And you might think, well, that's sick. You know, you're a sick person. Um, he had wanted to go home to be with Jesus for over 30 years. <laughs> he told me, he told me, and I, I don't know if this is true, I, I'm sure it's true because he, he never lied, but he said that he had a major heart problem uh, years and years ago, and the doctors didn't give him long to live, and he told his kids, he says, I taught you how to live, now I'm going to show you how to die. And it took him almost 35 years to do that. <laughs> Um, he just wanted to go home to be with Jesus. You know, that was, that was where, where his heart was and uh, where he, he wanted to be. And verse 6, it says, Without faith it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And then uh, the apostle goes on to talk to us about... Um, Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob. And then in verse 13, he says, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. Pastor John used to say that all the time. That he actually, in our century, he thought he was an alien. You know, he, he wanted to go back a few more years. Uh, people who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been th thinking of the country which they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Pastor John told me... Uh, that when he was in Korea, that he had made, uh, I don't know what you call these, is a scabbard, They're a thing that goes on your belt that he could put a little Gideon Bible in. You know, every, everybody else, they had something for a knife or something for, uh, you know, their bullets or whatever, but he had one that he could put a Bible in. And uh, it, that experience was so draining on him um, and so... Uh, I, I believe he, he, was, he experienced uh, post-traumatic syndrome or uh, you know, PTSD. I believe he did. He told me that one time he was so tired that instead of going around a, uh, a, land, a set of landmines, he just walked right through them. <laughs> and just like, okay, God, if you want to take me home, take me home. I'm too tired to go around. <laughs> you know, I'm ready to go home to be with Jesus. Praise God that didn't happen because there's some people here who probably wouldn't be here if that had, if that had happened. Um, then it goes on to say, and this, I think, exemplifies Pastor John. Uh, verse 32, it says, What more shall we say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, 
Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, gained what was promised, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Their women received back their dead, raised to life. And that's, that's a lot of pastors, a lot of ministers. It's just one victory after another. But then it goes on to say, and others were tortured, refused to be released so that they might gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were put to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. These are the ones that didn't win the victories, that didn't get, you know, the big church, that didn't, all that stuff. They, it says the world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith. David, Jephthah, Samuel, they were commended for their faith, and so were the ones that didn't get it in this life. And God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Pastor John is not going to be completely happy until we're all with him in heaven. Not, it says only together with us would they be made perfect. And so there, even though he's with Jesus and he's, he's just like Jesus, now the Bible says when you see him, you're going to be like him because you're going to see him as he really is. But there's still a there's still a gathering together of all of us, and uh, so here's the message to us. Here's what I believe Pastor John would say to us. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. It says we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. I believe Pastor John's up watching right now. I believe we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, people who've gone on before us. They're, they're up there, they're looking over the ramparts of heaven, and they're, they're, they're seeing, what are we going to do? What are those kids, what are my kids going to do? What are my grandkids going to do? What, they're, they're rooting us on, just like, just like when they, they sat and watched you play basketball or football or baseball or, or ballet or whatever it is. Your parents are there rooting you on. They want you to do well. And Pastor John's up there. He wants us to do well. How do we know this is real? How do we know that that's even? Uh, well, I just God just throws a miracle every once in a while. He just does a miracle every once in a while to let us know that these things are real. And uh, here, just a few months before uh, Pastor John and Betty moved to Portland, I was over at the house, and uh, Betty didn't recognize me. You know, and when they told her who I was, she says, well, I don't even know who he is, you know. <laughs> and uh, and I, I said, hi, Betty, I love you, you know, you're doing, you're doing great. And uh, so Pastor John and I talked for a while, and then at the end, I said, well, let's have a word of prayer before I leave. And I said, hey, Betty, you want to pray? <laughs> she prayed the most intelligent, uh, spiritual Prayer went on for an appropriate length of time. Her body is not doing all that well right now, but her spirit is doing great. And it, it is a sign. When we were worshiping here, she was so happy. She was just loving God, and her spirit is doing great. That, that is a sign that when we die, when this body is done, we're not done. And so I just want to I just want to pray for all of you and uh, especially for the family, uh, Father. I just ask that uh, that Pastor John will be proud of his family. That uh, I, I know he is, and I ask you to be with him. I ask you to strengthen him. I ask you to fill him with your Spirit and give give them the same 
bold dog tenacity that their grandfather had and the same spirit that just loves Jesus as their grandmother. I, I ask that uh, you do great things with them also. That, Lord, you, you, have, uh, you have mighty deeds for them to accomplish. And I ask that, that you would do this all for your glory, Lord Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. God bless you all. And uh, I just, again, I want to thank everybody for coming for the family. Bless you. Thank you.